How many of you are familiar with trial and hardship? Anyone ever had a trial? <laughs> hardship? I mean, we, it's, it's 2022, right? If we go back two years to March 2020 and the subsequent 18 months or so, and even now, we know trials, right? With COVID, with all that went on, we can say, yeah, I think if we sat down and took some time, we could talk about stories of illness. We could talk about stories of financial hardship, maybe loss of job, maybe, maybe losing a loved one, right? And that's just with kind of COVID and all that that entailed. But we could probably even dig deeper into our life stories and, 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 and talk about hardships that we felt. Maybe, maybe a son or a daughter who's maybe strayed away from the faith or maybe, maybe kind of distanced themselves from your family, from yourself, and you're feeling that pain and hardship. Maybe, maybe it's an upcoming move. Right where you, you leave something that you've known for a long time and you're like, I don't know what that's going to be like. That feels like a trial. right? We, we experience these things day in and day out. And many of you, I know, could testify and give testimony to, to struggles and hardships that you've experienced in your life. And inevitably, you probably ask the same question. We always ask a, a similar question where we say, God, why is this happening? Why now? And what do you want me to get out of this? Have any of you ever asked that? Have any of you ever prayed earnestly and said, God, I want an answer. I need to understand what is going on. Why have you brought this into my life? Well, this morning, as you're opening up your Bibles to John chapter 9, I want to submit an answer to you. And it's going to be an answer that I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes or so kind of unpacking, but ultimately it's going to come down to this. We need to understand that trials... And Jesus' hands are opportunities for God's glorious work to be displayed. So as you're thinking through, maybe even as I talk about trials and hardships, you have names and faces, you have experiences in your life kind of popping up in your mind. I want you to see those things, and I want you to kind of visualize seeing Jesus take those trials and hardships and transforming those into opportunities for God's glorious work to be shown. And we're going to look at that today. We're going to look at a trial in the life of one particular man and how Jesus kind of turns that to demonstrate God's glorious work. So you're already there, John chapter 9. Let me read the first seven verses, and we'll just kind of go through paragraph by paragraph. I'll make some comments along the way, make some application, and we'll come up kind of to, some, to three kind of conclusions that we can draw from this great miracle. So John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7 says this. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud. And he said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. This miracle is uh, instigated by a question from Jesus' disciples. The, the, the first verse there, as he passed by, so Jesus and his disciples are traveling And the disciples notice uh, a man who's born blind. And they take this opportunity to ask Jesus some clarifying questions. Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents? This is important for us to stop and, and consider this question. Because really it reveals the minds of the disciples and really the mind of the, uh, the, the ancient Near East individual. This is, this is kind of a concept and a worldview that they had. So, so disability, um, illness, things of that uh, at this time really boiled down to, in their mindset, two causes. There had to be two reasons for this to happen, or one of two reasons. Either this man sinned or his parents sinned. So the concept for the disciples and the first century Jew was that all sorts of disability and illness was a direct result of sin. But Jesus gives them a different answer. says it's not due to sin. It's something totally different. Let's clarify this question and this issue first. 
In one sense, all, sin, or, or all illness and all disability is related to sin. In the sense of, before sin entered the world, everything was perfect, right? When Adam and Eve sinned, that ushered in death. Not death right away, but death in the form of illness, of disability, of kind of disintegrating, deteriorating bodies, right? So in that sense, disability and illness comes from sin. But it doesn't necessarily come from direct sin. Well, this person sinned, therefore they have this illness, right? That doesn't always happen. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes our illnesses are a direct result of sin. If maybe in your youth you lived a licentious lifestyle of drinking, of drugs, of, of whatever, and now you're paying the consequences with, with, with a deteriorating liver, with, with, uh, with cancer, with different things, um, that's a direct result of sin. But just because you have cancer doesn't mean this was a sin situation, right? So do you, are you tracking with me? Okay. Well, then why do we tend to want to connect sin and illness together. I believe the disciples here, and I believe sometimes we even fall into it as 21st century Christians, we fall into the idea of, well, if I can connect illness, if I can t connect sin or suffering to sin, I now have the control, right? If, if I don't sin, if I, if I don't get involved in these things, then God will bless me or God will make my life smooth and easy, that is not necessarily the case. We, we try to put ourselves in the position of God when that happens. If I can control the situation, then I'll have a good outcome. When in sometimes in our life, we may live obedient lives, we may do everything that God wants us to do, and we still lose our job. And we still get that diagnosis from the doctor who says, you have six months to live. And we may say, but God, I did everything right. Why do I have this experience now? Why am I experiencing this suffering, this trial, this hardship? Well, I want us to think of trials and suffering in this way, not as something to be avoided, but as opportunities to trust God through trials and hardship. Why does God want us to trust him? Because he wants to do a glorious work through us and in us. So, the disciples ask, well, who sinned, this man or his parents? I told you, Jesus gave a different answer. We just read it, but let me highlight it for you. His, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, it's not that this man sinned or, uh, or his parents, but that the works of him who sent me, oh, I'm sorry, um, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. This is the lens of which we need to read the rest of this chapter. God is, or Jesus is, I'm sorry, this, this, this man who was born blind has this disability so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In him. We want to see what these works might be. Jesus expands in verse 4 what he means by this. And now he's kind of speaking to his disciples. He answered his disciples. Now he's expounding, teaching them. Verse 4, we must work the works of him who sent me. There's some pronouns in here that are really important. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me. Who's Jesus talking to? The disciples. So Jesus is including the disciples. We have a job to do, to work the works of him. Who's him? God. God. Great answer. God is the one who sent me. Who's me? Jesus. So Jesus here says, hey, we have a job to do. I have a specific job where the works of God are going to be displayed in, through me. Disciples, you're going to participate in this plan where the works of God will be displayed. And it is the work of him who sent me. God is at work. It's not something that Jesus necessarily will have the credit for or the disciples will have the credit for. They are going to do the works of God who sent Jesus. So there's, there's, a, there's an effort here. Uh, by both Jesus and the disciples in this work. But there's a second thing here that Jesus says. He says, um, in verse 4, the end of that first phrase, uh, sent, uh, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. So there's a time frame to this, while it is day. What, what, what goes on during the day? 
Many of you go to work. Many of us go to work. Some of us work the night shift, the second shift, the third shift. Well, I'm talking about kind of just traditionally, especially in the, in the first century. This is the day. This is when you go to work. It's light outside. Um, and then Jesus says, night is coming. You're not working at night, especially in the first century. You're not working at night. So he says there's an urgency to this job that needs to be done. The works are going to be done while it is still day. Night is coming. Does anyone remember what, how Jesus describes himself earlier in the book of John? Is he the, the light? All right, so, so Jesus here has kind of got a double meaning here. One, he is the light. And two, we're going to work during the light because night is coming. There's going to be a time when Jesus is not here. So there's even an urgency here, uh, physically on earth, that is. He's not here with the disciples. He's going to ascend into heaven. Uh, so anyways, in verse 5, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is the second time uh, he's stated this. Verse 6, having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. So Jesus here d- takes the opportunity to teach the disciples about uh, wh- why this man's been born blind He teaches them about the urgency of the work, and now he's going to perform this miracle. And John is very specific in how this miracle is done. John very easily could have said, Jesus healed him. But he gets very specific, and he says, what what does Jesus do? He spits on the ground, he makes mud, he puts it on his eyes, and then he tells the blind man, go to the pool at Siloam. And John is really helpful for us here, because we are not Hebrew speakers, Greek speakers. Anyone here speaking Hebrew or Greek? All right, so as, as he's or actually in Aramaic, he's speaking, but it's written in Greek. So John helps us to understand the significance of this pool. There's a little parenthetical statement. What is the pool of Siloam? What does that name mean? Which means sent, right there in the text in verse 7. It means sent. So think of this. Jesus, the Messiah, is the sent one sending the blind man to the pool, which means sent. Lots of meaning here. Lots of just, I mean, just very unique. So John is helping us to understand this. So Jesus makes the mud, mixes the mud, puts it on his eyes and says, go to the pool, Siloam. And the blind man does it. He goes in, he washes the mud off. And how does he come back? He can see the blind man has been healed. Let's end the story there. Seven verses in the works of God have been displayed, right? Amen. Let's, get, let's go get lunch. Let's go get breakfast. There's 30 more, 34 more verses in this chapter. So the story goes on. It's not just that the works of God are this healing. We're going to see that there's an even greater work at work here in the, the life of the blind man. But the story does continue. And, and let me just kind of give you a glimpse of where we're going. There's going to be four um, investigations where the, the, the blind man... And we're going to see his parents, too, but where there's four investigations about this miracle. All right, so let's pick up in verse 8, and we'll read through verse 12 to look at the first investigation. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, but, but he looks like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? He answered, The man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I do not know. So the first investigation comes from the crowds, the neighbors of the blind man. So we we have to think, too, what, what was it like for a blind man in the first century? He didn't have a job. He couldn't go out and work and and earn a living. The only job, the only living he could make was to beg. So can you imagine this blind man kind of waking up early in the morning before the streets get crowded? He gets out and he gets the the prime real estate near the city gate where everyone is going to be forced to pass through. He's going to sit down and he's going to put out his his hat or his bucket or whatever you can imagine that he's going to collect the alms of people passing. And he's going to rely on the benevolence. He's going to rely on the, um, the, the, the grace and generosity of his neighbors to provide for him. Maybe a few coins, maybe, maybe enough to, to buy some bread that night and to live another day. So he goes and he sits down, and these neighbors pass him daily. 
Do you think they know what the blind man looks like? They've seen him every day as he passes to work, as they, as they go to market. They see this man. He was the blind one begging. And so they are amazed when, when he comes walking up and he can see. And so the neighbors are talking to themselves. Can you hear them talking, kind of murmuring to one another? Is, is that the blind man? He's not in his normal spot. Is that him? And some of them are saying, well, yeah, that's him. And others are saying, no, that's just, that's just a lookalike. He, he looks very similar. No, that can't be the blind man, right? And so what do they do? They go to him and say, are you the blind man? Are you the one who sits right there and begs? And he says, I'm the man. And what, do you, what would you say if you saw a blind man and now he can see? What's your first question? Well, what happened? And he, he explains. He says, the man, Christ Jesus, uh, took some mud. He put it on my eyes. He told me to go to the pool. I went and I came back and I could see. What's the next question? Well, where is he? And the blind man says, I don't know. Well, how, how, how doesn't he know? He went away to the pool to wash. When he came back, Jesus was gone. He couldn't see. He was blind before, right? So he didn't see. Well, he went off this way. He went down that street. He doesn't know. So the crowds kind of accept his testimony, but they don't know what to do with it. And so we come up upon the second uh, investigation. The second investigation comes in verses 13 through 17. So let's read it. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? He said, He is a prophet. So we have a second investigation, and it's an investigation by a new group of people. First you had the crowds, the neighbors, and the blind man. The crowds and the neighbors don't, I mean, they, they get an answer. They say, well, yeah, this is the blind man. He can see, and he explains kind of what happened to him. But they don't know what to do with it. So they go to the people who should know uh, what to do next. They go to the Pharisees. A lot of times we think of the Pharisees as the enemy, right? They're, they're the bad guys. And for the most part in the Gospels, that's true. They're, they're the enemies of Jesus. They're, they're, they're in conflict. They're always trying to trip him up, or Jesus is trying to, to, to correct them, to clarify uh, who he is and, and all of those things. The crowds are not taking him to the Pharisees to get him in trouble. The crowds are taking him to the Pharisees because they genuinely are trusting the Pharisees. They're the ones, they're the experts of the law. They know the word. They should know what to do next. So they are genuinely taking them to the people who should know better. And so the Pharisees begin their own line of questioning. John is helpful for us again here uh, as he recounts this story. He doesn't just give us the dialogue. He tells us a little bit more in verse 14 when he gives us another statement. It doesn't, it's not in parentheses, like the first one, which told us what Siloam meant. But it's another parenthetical statement to help us remember the important parts of the story. Verse 14, now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Some key things there. It's the Sabbath, he made mud. Right? What do we know you're not supposed to do on the Sabbath? You're not supposed to work. And so John here says, hey, just so you know what is going on, it's the Sabbath and Jesus worked. He made mud. He created something. This was against the Pharisees' interpretation of the law. Please understand, this is not Jesus breaking the Mosaic law. This is Jesus breaking the rules which the Pharisees have added on to the Mosaic law. Well, what rules did, did he break? Well, there's three things within the Pharisaical tradition, which is their oral traditions, that Jesus broke at this moment. First off, healing was forbidden on the Sabbath, unless it was an emergency. You could heal in an emergency, but if it wasn't an emergency, you, you, it was illegal, it was breaking the law to heal. So what do you think? Let, let's kind of be judges here. Was this an emergency? No, 
because this man was born blind. This was his whole life. This wasn't, uh, this wasn't an accident of, of uh, you know, got something in his eyes and he's been blinded. And so Jesus kind of came to the rescue. This was a man whose whole life uh, had, been, uh, had been in darkness, had been blind. We're going to find out later um, that, uh, that, that he's of age when his parents are interviewed. So we know he's at least an adult. He's, he's, he's an, an adult, so this has been at least 16 years, if not more, that he's been like this. So the first one is uh, healing. He's broken because it wasn't an emergency. The second law within the oral tradition was that kneading was forbidden on the Sabbath. So you couldn't work your dough to bake it. It had to be done before um, the Sabbath. And so his making of mud would kind of fall under the, the legal realm of kneading, of creating, you know, kind of working the spit and dirt together to make mud, right? That's the second law that he's broken. And the third law, and again, seems strange to us, but anointing the eyes was forbidden. To put something on your eyes at the Sabbath was forbidden. So if you, you know, if you have cream or anything else, medicine that you need to put in your eyes, you had to wait until after the Sabbath or do it before the Sabbath. So three laws in the oral tradition, Jesus is broken. And the Pharisees are experts in the law. So they focus in on Jesus breaking the law when a man has been born blind and been healed. Does anyone else find that amazing? Here they are staring a miracle in the face, and they're like, well, look at this little little quip, you know, this little, little thing I'm going to quibble over these things. They miss the point. They miss the point. And so, but some of them get it. Some of them are questioning, was this really a miracle? And, and what was the source of the miracle? It, we, we can't deny that he can see now, but, but is this really from God? And the other side says, there's a miracle that happened. It can't be from something other than God. It can't be a sinner who's done this because why would God honor that? So this is our second investigation. But there's one thing that I want to point out in this second investigation that's going to tie back to the first. Who did Jesus say when the crowds asked him, who healed you? What happened? What did, what did the man born blind say? He said, the man, Christ Jesus, right? I, I didn't point that out, but, but hopefully we remember that. Now when the Pharisees say, well, well how did this happen? He explains it. Um, then they say, well, where is he? How, who is he? And then they say, who do you think he is? In verse, uh, in verse 17, what does he say? He said to them in answer to this question, who is this man? He is a prophet, so what we're going to see here in, in, the, in this storyline, John highlights a journey of faith in the life of the man born blind. Okay, first he recognizes, or he doesn't, he doesn't recognize, he just states, well, who did this? It was the man named Jesus. Now when he's asked again, he's kind of beginning to, the, the picture's getting clearer for him, and he says, well, he must be a prophet. He's a prophet. Man to prophet. Right? So the Pharisees are not happy with this answer. They want to kind of explore further because they want to debunk what's happened. They want to, they want to put Jesus down. They want to make sure that everyone obeys the law, follows the rules. And so we find a third investigation. The blind man goes off the scene, and the Pharisees instead call his parents. In verse 18, verse 18 through 23, let's read it. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind. And had received his sight, until they called the parents of the man who had been who had received his sight, and they asked them, "Is this your son, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see?" Verse twenty. His parents answered, "We know that this is our son, and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know. Nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself." Verse 22, his parents said these things because they feared the Jews. For the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So the Pharisees are looking to discredit the blind man. And so they go to the source, right? Because the blind man keep emphasizing the fact that he was born blind. So they go to the parents 
And they say, come on, just, just, just reason with us. Tell us the truth. Was he really that blind? Right? Like, like the parents should know. And, and they say, we know this is our son, and he was blind. He's been blind his whole life. And if anyone should know, they would know. So the Pharisees now, so they weren't able to, to establish, well, he really wasn't blind. This is all a big hoax. The Pharisees then want to say, well, well what happened? How, how is it that he can see now? And his parents dodge the question. And John helps us understanding the context of what's going on and gives us this extra statement. This extra statement is that the, the Jews, which is both the Pharisees and the other religious leaders, all right? So the Jews is, is not all of the Jewish people, but that it's these leaders within, within that community, the, the religious and legal leaders. They say, John tells us that they were looking for a reason for anyone to follow Jesus, they would be put out of the synagogue. Now this is really important because being put out of the synagogue was basically a severing from the community. A severing from the community of which they knew. Right? So, so if you had a death in the family, if you had a need, you would go to your synagogue and they were the ones who would take care of you. Imagine being severed from the church when you had a need. How many times have someone in the church come alongside you to help you? Right? When, there was, when, when you were sick, someone cooked a meal and brought it for you. When there was a death in the family, there was someone there to, to comfort you and to listen to you, right? Similarly, but even more so within the synagogue, this was their cultural identity. This was their community. So to be put out of the community was to be removed from business, to be removed from people that would care for you, to people that would be there to, to, to meet your needs if you had them and when you had them. And so his parents, knowing this, dodge the question because they don't want to be severed from the community. They want to be part of the community. And they say, he's of legal age. Just go ask him. His testimony counts. Ask him. Which brings us to our fourth investigation. Our fourth investigation is 24 through 34. Let me read it. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple. But we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Boy, this, this fourth investigation really kind of starts to draw in from the beginning of the story and kind of starts to wrap a bow on things. It's, it's, it, I love this. This paragraph really uh, unpacks and, and this, this, whole, this whole chapter. So let's go through it. A second time... The, the Pharisees come to this man and, and investigate again. They, they kind of reached a dead end uh, from the parents and from their first investigation, the crowds. So they're going to go back again, and they're going to really nail him this time. And they start with this phrase, give glory to God, right? This, this is not really, they're not coming with, you know, really humble spirits of really like, let's let God come into this, even though it may say, hey, give glory to God, right? That sounds like a good phrase. But here it's this way to try to, um, you know, when we were kids, you know, um, you know, we'd say something like swear on the Bible or something like that. You know, put your hand on the Bible if you really mean this, that kind of. It's that kind of thing, right, where they're really trying to, to say, hey, this is really serious stuff. But they don't really, they're really not putting it in the realm of giving glory to God. They're trying to, to intimidate him. And they, they come with not a question but a statement, give glory to God, we know this man is a sinner. 
And he answered them and says, whether he's a sinner, I don't know, but let me tell you. And he gives that great testimony, right? The testimony that we all should have. We need this 30-second testimony in our life. I once was blind, but now I see. Right? And so the blind man says, you know, this whole sinner stuff, this whole theology that you're trying to get at, I don't know and I don't care about that. All I know is I was blind and now I see. And then, again, remember the Pharisees are trying to discredit this. And they say, well, tell us again how he did this. Some of you laughed when we, when we read it, which was a perfect reaction because that's what John wants us to do. He wants us to see how absurd the Pharisees are acting. And so uh, he says to them, why are you asking? I already told you. Do you want to become his disciples too? Wow. This blind beggar who now sees is so bold to stand up to the Pharisees, to stand up to the Jews and say, wow, do you want to become his disciples? And did you hear it in the story? Can you just, can you picture them all just aghast? Maybe, you know, their chins drop or maybe they grit their teeth. They're ready to argue and fight. And they say, how dare you? We know you're his disciple. We are what? Disciples of Moses. Of Moses. This is this pious, you know, they straighten their tie. They got their suit coat on right. And they said, we are from Moses. But even as they say that, they betray the truth. First off, they say, we know where we come from. We know Moses. We don't know where this man came from. But you know what's interesting? Just a couple chapters earlier in John chapter 7, verse 27, they asserted, the Pharisees asserted very, uh, very, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Very confidently, we know where this man came from. He's from Nazareth. So what is it? Do you know where he's from? Or do you not know where he's from? And then they say, well, we're disciples of Moses. Listen to what John says what Jesus says, John records in chapter 5, verse 46 and 47. Jesus, kind of condemning the Pharisees, says to them, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he, Moses, wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the blind man, the blind beggar, speaks to these experts in the law, these experts in Moses, and basically says, you think you know Moses. How do you miss Jesus? We go back to what Jesus says, and Jesus says to those Pharisees, if you really knew Moses, you would know me. And so the condemnation that is heaped on these Pharisees because of their blindness, because of their, their rejection of Jesus. So the blind man goes on and, and, and basically says, look, we know that God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to people that are obedient, that love him. And that's what gives them the power, Jesus, the power to heal. So if he truly was a sinner, well, then how did he do this? How did he heal me? And so the blind man frustrates the Pharisees. And the Pharisees finally say, well, we know that you're a sinner. And they cast him out, which is exactly what his parents were afraid of. This goes all the way back to the beginning. Because what did the, what did the disciples ask of Jesus? Is this man blind because he sinned or his parents sinned? And Jesus says, no, it's so that the works of God may be seen. What did the Pharisees then assume? What was their worldview? That he is the sinner. That's why he was blind. They missed it. They have missed the works of God on display in Jesus. And they cast him out. One more investigation, and we'll wrap this up quickly. But don't miss this. This is important. Verses 35 through 41. Last interrogation. We had four investigations, and now we come to this fifth one. It all culminates. This is the most important one. Verse 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? 
Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. This last interrogation, this last investigation is now Jesus and the blind man. Jesus, notice, he seeks him out, seeks out the blind man and says, hey, I got a question for you. He doesn't ask, hey, who did this? Uh, What happened? Were you really blind? He goes right to the heart of the matter. And Jesus says, do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man is a title for the Messiah, right? So he says, do you believe in the Messiah? Do you believe he has come? And the blind man says, well, who is he that I may believe? He's open, but he doesn't know. And Jesus says to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. What a great phrase. You have seen him. This was the blind man. And now he sees, but you have seen him, the son of man. And it is he who is speaking to you. Jesus says in this kind of roundabout way, it is me. I am the Messiah. And the blind man says, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. What did the blind man initially say about Jesus? He was a man. And then to the Pharisees, he said what? Well, he's a prophet. And then he sees Jesus. And what does he say? Lord, God, I believe. Well, you say, well, how do we know? Lord, God, what does he do right after that? And he worshiped him. So we see this journey of faith in the blind man. He goes from being healed physically, saying, hey, this man came up and did this. And now he bows the knee and worships his Lord and Savior. But Jesus isn't done. He uses this opportunity to teach the crowds a lesson. Have you ever done that? Have you ever been around somebody, something, and you want to say something loud enough for someone else to hear, but you're not saying it to them directly, but you are? You've done that? You know, maybe it's the kids, you know, they're playing in the other room a little loud, and you're like, boy, I wish it was a little quieter in here. You know, something like that. It's kind of what Jesus does here. He speaks up and he says, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see and those who see may become blind. And the Pharisees heard this and they say, Well, you think we're blind? And Jesus says, Because you claim to see and you've missed me, you are blind. But those who are blind, who didn't know me, who now know me, see. It's better for you to have been blind than to claim to see and be made blind. So here it is. What is the works of God that are on display in this chapter? There's a wonderful miracle of making a blind man see, but the work of God is salvation. The work of God is seeing the blind man go from he's a man to Lord I believe and worships him. You see, our trials that we face are opportunities for the works of God to be, to be on display in us. Well, what does that look like? First, trials in Jesus' hands display God's glory. Let me, let me give this, this warning, though, this, this understanding. Sometimes it may take time to see the works of God. This man had been born blind. Was it really worth 18 years of blindness, 20 years of blindness, 30 years of blindness? We don't know how old he is. Was it really worth it for the works of God to be on display? What do you think he would say? Absolutely. In the middle of it, 15 years in, 10 years in, he might be like, I don't know about this. We may have those trials and say, I don't know about this. The works of God might be on display through your trials. The second thing is trials will hurt. What what did this blind man experience? He was cast out, cut off from that community. That was painful. That was hard. But what did he gain with that? A savior. A new community, right? That comes alongside him. Second thing that we need to know, growing faith in the midst of trials displays the glory of God. When you're going through that, that cancer diagnosis, when you're going through the loss of a loved one, and you remain steadfast and trusting God, other people are watching you, and God's glory is shining through you as you display faith. And sometimes it's growing faith, right? We don't just jump into those hard situations and be like, Lord, I believe, everything's great. Sometimes it takes time, but God's word, God's faithfulness is saying, trust me, demonstrate that faith. 
And then thirdly, God's ultimate work is revealed in redeeming us through the blood of Christ. What works of God are we looking for? Our salvation. You have been saved by grace through faith. If you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, I invite you today to do just that. To understand that that we're all sinners in need of a Savior. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. But God, in His great mercy and love for us, sent His Son Jesus to die on the cross for us, to pay that penalty that we deserved. He lived a life that we couldn't live. He lived a perfect life. He died the death that we all deserved. So that by faith, by trusting in Him, by believing in Him, we could have eternal life. That is the ultimate work of God that we need and that He wants to display in us. Would you bow your head with me as I pray? Lord, thank You for this wonderful miracle of of healing, but even better, one of salvation. Lord, I pray for comfort for anyone in here who is experiencing trials and hardships right now. Lord, I pray that You would give them grace that they need, faith that they need to to persevere under that. Lord, give them a vision for seeing how your work might be done through their trials and hardships. Lord, I pray if there's anyone in here that, that doesn't know you as their Savior, Lord, that they would turn their life towards you, that they would admit that they are sinners, that they would place their faith and trust in you and receive Jesus Christ as their Savior. We love you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>